silver investment farm preference. It depends on who you are and what your size is. Um, maple leaves, eagles, bullion bars. I don't necessarily like 90% old silver coins. Uh, and I don't like things that are a step or two away. So I like silver eagles, silver maples. I own philharmonics, and I think I probably own some other silver coins too. Um, I actually lean toward maple leaves because I think that in some jurisdictions, having a Canadian coin might be more acceptable than having a U.S. coin. Uh, and then I have bullion. Uh, so if you want to own silver, own silver. Don't own silver coins or silver collectibles. Oh, now we have all kinds of questions. Do we? What do we project for silver price as the economy is bearish? Okay, first off, if the economy turns bearish, and it will. Second thing is, when will it turn bearish? Will it turn bearish in the next two years the way we think? Or will it be five years from now? That's the next step in the analysis. Are, are we have our main scenario, which we have projections out 10 years for supply, demand, and price for silver. And then we have a bearish scenario and a bullish scenario that we supply our clients. And then we have other scenarios that we work with so we're pulling those three scenarios together. In our bearish scenario, we would not be surprised to see the price fall back to somewhere, be, you know, ranging, let's say ranging between $12 and $16 and averaging around $14 in a future recession or a future period of time like we saw in the 1990s with strong economic growth, strong stock market, and very positive alternate investments. What drives the price of daily silver? I said earlier, you know, it's really futures, options, and, and trading that drives the daily price and the interdaily price. But they queue off of the longer-term fundamentals, even if you don't see it. They're looking at those fundamentals. In a recent interview, we said, uh, see, silver and gold rising sharply. What do you consider a sharp rise in the price of silver? We would not be surprised to see the average price of silver over $30. We may not, you know, we had uh, a year or two ago, we had a much more pessimistic economic outlook for the world and for the United States than we do now. And we had the average silver price approaching, if not exceeding, the previous peak of $35 an ounce. And again, you have to understand that's the average annual price of silver in a year where the price ranged probably from $20 to $50. So if I tell you that I thought that we lowered that because our economic view is less hostile uh, to the world than it used to be, I told you that we wouldn't be surprised to see the price somewhere between $31 and $34 an ounce on average. That would tell you that on an intraday basis, we might see prices between $20 and $50. It could go over $50, uh, but not so much. It's very similar uh, situation with gold. And our expectation is, again, economic conditions might turn down late this year, later this year, second half of this year into 25 and part of the reason for that is our political concerns on a global basis as well as nationally um it was not a coincidence that a week after george w bush was elected president that we issued our long-term gold and silver by recommendations political issues are very important uh and they could cause the prices to rise within the next couple of years, but then come off. Yeah, you know, there's another question. Price season LCI yeah, they're in there. Um okay, I, I think I already addressed this. Uh yeah, this is the one. Give your forecast for both gold and silver by the end of, of 2029. That's the wrong way to look at. Yeah, you know, why are you picking 2029? You know, are you planning to die in January 2030? Yeah, you know, did not care about your heirs. Yeah, 
I can tell you where we think the price of, of gold and silver would be in 2029. And it's not much different from where we are now. But the question is going to be, where do we go in the ensuing five, six years? Because I think that the prices could rise very sharply and they could come back. Yeah. Uh, if the world is lucky, we're in better shape politically and economically and financially in 2029 than we are today. And the prices may be a little bit lower than they are today because the risks of having exposure to the general economy, to currencies, to stocks and bonds may be a little bit lower. But you're going to miss a whole lot of stuff in between. We had a bank in the 80s and early 90s that actually um, hired us to do standard deviations of commodities. It was the trade finance department of a bank. And they were looking at Stand, they wanted from us just simple calculations, standard deviation of the price variance over a given period of time of various commodities that they were providing trade finance for. And it could have been one year or it could have been five years. Sometimes they were get, getting involved in like five or 10 year program. They, what's the standard deviation of copper or lead, or coal, thermal coal or shrimp um, over that five year period of time? And we would calculate that and give it to them so that they could show their risk managers, hey, you know, we're going to loan these people the X, we're going to charge them Y interest rate, and that has a risk premium of Z, and we think that we have a pretty good chance that, that, that we get to keep that risk premium. New boss comes in and says, oh, you're looking at standard deviation. You just need to look at the standard deviation between the time when you start the loan and the end of the loan. And the staff argued against that. They brought us in uh, to explain, no, because you're exposed to that company throughout that relationship, and the price can go up or down and that bankrupt that company in the interim. And by the time you get to the end of that five-year period, whatever it is, yeah, the price, may, the, the price volatility may have died out, but your client has gone bankrupt and you've lost your loan. And he said, you know, you're all wrong. And he insisted that they shift to do that. They shifted to do that. And that bank went bankrupt within probably three or four years of when that guy took over. Only partly because of his lack of understanding of risk uh, in commodities but that was definitely a contributing factor. Here's our gold-silver ratio. And there have been questions, what do you think the gold-silver ratio is going to be? We think that gold will outperform silver in some ways. So we're looking at a ratio uh, that ranges between, say, 65 and 90 over the next several years. Uh, silver will do well. There will be times when silver outperforms gold, and the ratio might spike down to that 65 that we saw a few years ago. Uh, but we do think that gold probably over the next several years will outperform silver. Why don't central banks buy silver? Uh, I guess because they don't want it. Uh, no, that's, I'm sorry for being flippant. And could that change? It could change. It's highly unlikely. Central banks own monetary assets, and they're very cautious about the types of monetary assets that they're in. That's why 62% of their foreign exchange uh, reserves are in U.S. dollars because they say, what's my risk to the downside for the dollar compared to what's my risk in any other currency? You know, 62%, 60% dollars, you know, don't hold me to this, but maybe 10% in euros, 10%, 20% euros, 10% uh, 5% in the, uh, yen, 5% in pounds sterling. Yeah, it's uh, 60, 80, 90, and the other 10% in everything else. Central banks like to have secure assets that are liquid, transparent, and uh, sufficient to be uh, sufficiently large enough markets to give them the liquidity that they need. Uh, gold sort of meets that 
And the London Bullion Market Association has worked very hard uh, to help convince the banking and the, the central banking industry, the Bank for International Settlements, and the IMF that maybe gold can be considered a tier one asset suitable for use in monetary reserves. And the fact that gold is held with 1.2 billion ounces of gold held by central banks uh, or 1 billion ounces of gold held by central banks from a historical point gives the, the liquidity there. Silver is a much smaller market, probably, you know, in terms of dollar value, maybe the 10% or less than gold. It's just too small, too illiquid, and too opaque for central banking authorities to think that it is suitable as a tier one asset that they could hold as a monetary reserve. And that's unlikely to change. You know, 400 years ago, 600 years ago, silver was a much larger part of the global financial system. It was used in currencies and in coins. You know, the U.S. got out of the coinage business in the 60s. Most of the other countries got out in the late 1970s, early 1980s, when the price went from $5 to $50 to $16 in a year. Uh, they're probably not going to go back. So, yeah, it's possible. Um, but as God said, not in my lifetime. Gold standards that are not convertible or redeemable. We've talked about this in some of our other videos. Um, we don't have a lot of, but it, a gold standard that's not convertible doesn't have a lot of street cred. Yeah. Hey, yes, I've pegged my currency to gold, but you can't come to me with my currency and say, oh, if you think my currency is worth $35 an ounce, here's your currency, give me your gold. Um, I think that a non-convertible or redeemable gold standard uh, lasts as long as they have in the past, which is sometimes months. Sometimes a few years. Not really a viable way to convince anyone that your currency has a stability, additional stability. Um, is silver North American centric? Um, yes, it is. A lot of the information is generated by Americans and Canadians. Um, there is interest elsewhere. In the late 1990s, there were several, you know, well, if you looked at the three largest silver mining companies, uh, one was in Europe, one was in Australia, and one was in Mexico. Uh, and the Mexican company belonged to the Silver Institute, along with various other North American silver mining companies and maybe one or two Latin American, South American companies. Um, and the largest Latin American, Australian, and European silver producers got together and said, we would like to belong to an effective silver producers association. We don't want to join the Silver Institute for a variety of reasons. We would like to see a new silver Producers Association created, probably headquartered in Mexico City. And the companies that provided the major financing for the Silver Institute said, well, it's easy for you to come along after the fact, after we've supported the silver industry for all these years, uh, after we've spent all this money and, and come up and say, well, this is how you should be doing. And so these Companies from around the world, including two of the largest silver companies, both of whom will buy products of the producers, um, said, well, let's have a meeting. Let's get together in Mexico City and talk about what should silver producers around the world be doing to help support the silver industry. And the companies that belong to the Silver Institute declined the opportunity to do this. There was a similar overture in the early 80s uh, from Chinese country companies, and actually the People's Bank of China. Uh, and the People's Bank of China was upset because the World Silver Survey was making certain claims about Chinese, the People's Bank of China, 
selling silver from their monetary reserves, when in fact what they were doing was selling silver that was refined as a byproduct from imported copper, lead, and zinc concentrates. And we knew that because we were helping companies that were selling them the concentrates. We were helping the People's Bank of China, and we were helping the Chinese refiners find non-Chinese buyers for that silver. Now, the People's Bank of China allowed for changes in their regulations to make, in, to allow Chinese refiners to be able to bid competitively for complex multi-metallic ores that had gold and silver byproduct uh, concentrates uh, so they could import this stuff because they were producing 30, 40% of the world's lead and zinc and copper refined output. And they were in, wanting to import concentrates from Latin America and Australia, and Indonesia and other places uh, to, to feed their smelters and refineries. But these guys couldn't compete because of regulations in China. So we got the People's Bank of China to say, if you re-export your silver and you sell your gold to Chinese companies at certain price levels, then you can do this. Uh, we then helped them find offshore outlets for that silver. And it was more than 50 million ounces of silver that came out of China at that time uh, and went into other countries. And the silver surveys were saying, the World Silver Surveys, not the CPM Group Silver Survey. So CPM Group Silver Surveys had it right. And we talked about this, but the World Silver Survey were saying that this was silver that the PBOC was selling from its inventories. And the PBOC came to us and said, hey, you know, um, we'd like to talk to the Silver Institute and clarify what where this silver was coming from. And I said, well, I don't have anything to do with the Silver Institute or the World Silver Survey anymore. I, I, you know, I haven't done anything with them for like six years, but I'll send them that message. And uh, for a couple of years, they didn't even re respond. Uh, you know, and so the PBOC said, let's talk. Let's see what we can do. And the Silver Institute did come around and they did do, and they continue to do stuff in China uh, ever since that time. But there was about two years where they you know, we just don't want to talk. Chinese government, the People's Bank of China, but they did change that. But there's never been a new or renewed effort to bring in those byproduct producers that account for 70% of mine production um, that we know of. So silver is somewhat North America centric. Um, there are obviously very interested parties in China and Australia, and in Latin America, and in other parts of the world. Uh, but a lot of the data and analysis still comes through North America or London. Misplaced fear of future competency. <clears throat> Gold was confiscated during the Great Depression when investors where when gold probably represented a third of the monetary base globally, third of the money in circulation was gold, this gold, gold, gold coins. And in the depression, people were very fearful of the purchasing power of their currencies, all currencies. Uh, and so they were taking money out of the bank, taking money out of the economy, not investing, not saving, in currencies, they were putting it into gold and hoarding the gold that complicated the ability to put money into the economy to get us out of the Great Depression. And that was because gold was about a third of the world's monetary base. Today, gold is about 0.5, 0 0.6% of the monetary base. The monetary system has been changed dramatically. And when we get into recessions or even worse situations, as we did in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2020, monetary authorities have the ability to flood the world with currencies, to stave off the bleeding, and then suck it back out when the economy recovers. 
So A, gold is inconsequentially small compared to the global financial system and monetary base. And B, it's not needed anymore. So there's no reason for a government to try to confiscate gold in the United States and in most other parts of the developed world. Could be different. You look at China, China has a very clear stated policy. We want to own gold at the People's Bank of China. We want to own gold at the government. And we think that every responsible, wealthy Chinese person also ought to own gold. We're not interested in confiscating your gold. We think you should have some gold. We think it's prudent to be part of that, uh, to have some of your assets in gold. So I think that uh, fears of future confiscation are based on fear, and there's no real evidence to support that. Where should you hold your gold? Mm -hmm. a place where you can see it. Um, we don't necessarily suggest holding physical gold and silver in multiple countries. Uh, we sometimes suggest to individual clients to do that. I personally do. Uh, I think, you know, one, I think two or three jurisdictions is suitable, but you always have to be careful as to what jurisdiction and also the counterparty risk of whatever institution or depository you're holding. It's very funny because a lot of people see Singapore as this almost risk-free jurisdiction for holding assets. But the Singapore government has a rule that says, in a crisis, anything you have in Singapore, we can take. Wow. Yeah, that's good.